Hello everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening from wherever you are watching. Welcome back. This is the Breakout Defender track. I'm Swapnil Shinde, and I will be moderating this session for today. Just keep in mind, if you have any questions, please submit them in the Q&A tab just, right, just in the right-hand side uh, of this video. Uh, we will have around 5 to 10 minutes in the end uh, for the uh, questions you have. Now, uh, I'm thrilled to invite Mr. Shan Singh. Uh, Mr. Shan Singh has over 25 years of experience in information technology and security. He is currently a principal architect, security architect at F5. He is currently co uh, he currently co-leads the OAS machine learning security top 10 and machine learning security verification standard projects. So over to you, Mr. Shan Singh. Thanks, Swapnil. Um, let me do that. Okay. So, hello everyone. Um, uh, welcome to uh, our session on security for machine learning systems. Um, so before we begin, just, just a few things. So this is a beginner track. And uh, what I've tried to do, this is actually the first time I'm presenting this specific content. What I've tried to do is make the content uh, without a lot of the machine learning jargon or terminology. Um, so really another uh, title for this presentation could be uh, Beginner's Guide to Machine Learning for AppSec Engineers. And, and just before I start, a couple of things on uh, admin. Um, I had a co-presenter who was going to be helping me uh, show some of the hands-on demos that, that, that I'd written in the blurb. Um, fortunately or unfortunately, uh, Saga is actually in in, per, uh, in Paris at the moment. So unfortunately, we won't be able to show you some of those hands-on demos. And, and another thing is uh, I will be uh, giving a link to the presentation uh, at the end of the uh, at the end of the deck. So you don't have to worry about taking screenshots or anything. Okay, so let's begin. So who am I? So thank you for Sapnil for introducing me. So I uh, currently work at F5 and I have um, three sort of hats or three roles that I have at F5. So, so my primary role at F5 as a principal security architect uh, is to work with a lot of our customers and partners on uh, application and API security, denial of service mitigation, and also bot mitigation type things. Right? Um, the other two roles uh, what I would call community or innovation type roles, right? So uh, within the Office of CTO and the Open Source Program Office, I help uh, inside our company, help uh, engineers and others and employees um, innovate, whether it's uh, business process improvements inside our company, whether it's uh, the next big thing for F5 uh, outside our company, you know, new products and features. And part of that involves working with uh, open source software, but also communities. So some, some of that involves uh, creating communities externally, and some of that is what we call inner source or creating an internal community where uh, internally we can use source code as well, right? Um, as well as that, uh, I help out uh, as of this year with the DevSecOps uh, and Zero Trust Working Groups at Crowd Security Alliance, and I've uh, I've been uh, fortunate enough to be able to contribute to their uh, training and upcoming certifications. But what we're talking about today is that I help uh, co-lead a couple of projects to do with machine learning in OWASP. And specifically, today we'll be talking about the top 10 risks with machine learning. Um, before I move on, uh, I want to say that uh, with the 25 years experience that I've had, uh, none of that has had a machine learning or artificial intelligence background, right? Now, that little bit of information is going to be important a little bit later on in our presentation. So let's get started. Um, when Let's talk about um, some definitions, right? So I'll start with uh, AI first, because that's largely what people uh, talk about as of 2023. Um, so again, I'm using just um, English type words without going too much into uh, jargon here, right? So artificial intelligence are effectively programs with human-like functions uh, that can do things like reasoning, uh, problem solving, 
and decision making, right? So the two typical types that you hear about is uh, artificial narrow intelligence. This is narrow intelligence means uh, it is good for a subset of tasks, right? Um, and this is largely the type of artificial intelligence that you deal with day to day, and, and we'll go into all the different types, right? And uh, I've listed here uh, artificial general intelligence or AGI. This is largely what you'll start hearing marketing hype about. This is more of a general or human-like intelligence, right? And um, this is where a lot of research is going on, but certainly this is still in the in not in reality, as it were, right? We don't necessarily have uh, generalized uh, artificial intelligence, right? Another term uh, that can be used there is um, artificial super intelligence, uh, which, as you can tell from uh, the the wording, is more in the realms probably of philosophers or uh, science fiction, as it were, right? The other part to sort of understand about artificial intelligence is not all artificial intelligence has to involve machine learning. And so you might think, you know, what are the types of artificial intelligence that don't involve machine learning? Well, in specific scenarios, or, or sorry, um, in use cases, uh, you may be able to program just a set of rules uh, that that doesn't need to pre-program itself, right? So examples of this, are you may have heard of uh, robotic process automation or in manufacturing, a lot of these sorts of industries use artificial intelligence where they don't have to uh, necessarily leverage on machine learning, right? So when we get to machine learning, which is what we'll be talking about today, you know, so these are algorithms or processes that in quotations can learn from past data and they're able to predict future outcomes, right? So uh, the important bit here is they don't need further explicit programming to be able to do that in order to predict the future outcomes. So this is why it's so popular to use. Uh, the reason that's mentioned is because there are tasks that humans or developers can do. Um, and if they're able to do those tasks, they don't necessarily have to rely on a machine to be able to uh, predict future outcomes or do explicit programming, right? So there are a, a set of tasks that don't necessarily always have to rely on the machine. So within the area of machine learning, there are three sort of subsets of ways that uh, machines learn that we'll sort of briefly discuss a bit later. And you may have heard of these terminologies. We've got supervised learning, unsupervised learning, and reinforcement learning, right? So we'll go into these a, a little bit later. So within machine learning, we have the field that is called deep learning, right? And this is largely taking up uh, probably the mind share of the research these days as of 2023. This is your large artificial neural networks. This is vast amount of computing resources that can adapt and learn from an insanely vast amount of data, right? So if you think about large language models, um, that would fit into this deep learning uh, category, right? So typically what deep learning is used for is things like uh, image recognition or natural language processing, which is, uh, you know, this is where it gets into the large language models or LLMs, right? GPT and things like that. So, you know, it's, it's probably pretty obvious to most people uh, in the world, unless we've been living under rocks, why AI is so hot in 2023. Um, AI is certainly not a new thing, but the in the insane interest in artificial intelligence came largely from the growth in users for ChatGPT, right? Now, this is not a bad thing. This is a very, very good thing, right? So if you look at uh, the, the, the graphic there around some of the other consumer or uh, applications that we use, they also propelled some some levels of security and and brought more research right so uh if i look at things like whatsapp for example right whatsapp when it was using uh whisper as its uh, encryption mechanism right a lot of data encryption and rest were done prior to that but uh given the popularity of whatsapp uh, a lot more people started looking into uh areas of data and uh, data 
at uh, in, in transit or in rest, right? Similarly, with things like Facebook and, and Google, right, you may not uh, be aware, but it was because of those social uh, networking type applications that we got a growth in things like OAuth and OpenIDC, right? The idea of having identity mapped with authorization, right? So that propelled the security industry forward, right? So similarly with ChatGPT, it is a great thing that a lot of research is now coming in uh, into machine learning and AI. Um, a lot of people are concentrating on large language models, uh, but as as we described, this is a subset of uh, the larger set of machine learning, right? So as I explained, um, you know, AI usage is not new to, to all of us. And um, I think you would be hard pressed to be any type of um, individual in the world that that is not in some way interacting with, with AI, right? So if we look at uh, common things like recommendation systems, like online retail shops, right? These these folks, these industries rather, uh, invented recommendation systems. So you think of your Netflixes, you know, uh, when we talk uh, jokingly about, you know, the algorithms and your Facebook feeds and your LinkedIn feeds, you know, these systems are uh, AI working in the background, right? And then we look at things like facial recognition or biometrics, right? Uh, used in law enforcement, close circuit TVs. Um, if you if you travel, you'll be seeing these things at airport security, but also in consumer consumer gadgets, right? Um, I use facial recognition to turn on my iPhone. Um, I use Touch ID to turn on my Mac, so on and so forth, right? These are all different forms of AI that we use daily, right? Digital assistants, you know, your series. Uh, your Alexas, all of these sorts of things. Um, if you're a gamer like me, right, um, if you're playing first-person shooters or role-playing games, largely the non-playable characters that you're dealing with are AI, right? And this is what I was talking about with the subset of rules that they can be programmed. Is it did they think for themselves within the game or are they pre-programmed uh, with a set of rules to say, if, if, if the player does this, then you behave like this, right? And also things like uh, uh, Pokemon Go, right? Uh, augmented reality apps. So these are some of the things that we come across in our daily life. And we've largely had a lot of these for, in some cases, you know, over a decade, right? Uh, some cases, even longer. Now, as security practitioners, we run across this almost everywhere uh, that we typically work, right? So if we look at things like endpoint detection, which is, probably the next generation of antivirus and anti-malware on desktops and, and operating systems, right? Um, AI is used to be able to th uh, check for things like malicious binaries or anomalous system behavior. If we look at things like network security, which a lot of you folks uh, may be uh, doing in your day-to-day -day work, right? There's uh, traffic analysis where you're not able to necessarily uh, these days get unencrypted traffic to be able to peek inside it, but are you able to do analysis of the network traffic to be able to work out what's happening, right? Denial of service protection is a big thing. Um, anomalous traffic, you know, what, what behavior changed the resource consumption of um, my uh, protected objects or my servers? And intrusion detection systems, right? Uh, application security, which is where I work at, at F5, um, a growing area is this idea of API assets or traffic learning. So a lot of a lot of companies that I speak to um, have uh, trouble working out how many API endpoints or assets they have. And this became an industry because we're not doing enforcement of the APIs at the gateway level, right? So the idea of uh, API discovery or traffic learning, this is all AI working under the hood, right? Similarly with WAFs, this uh, attack uh, pattern signatures, whether it's down to your Kubernetes layer or across in your data centers, right? Uh, another, uh, I think in my personal view, uh, growing area of AI is in the observability space in systems, right? This is where uh, with, technologies that are also quite hot at the moment, like eBPF, you're able to use uh, telemetry data from operating at the operating system level or in Kubernetes at the pod level 
and then work out whether there's things that are anomalous, right? A lot of those things can have security implications. Some of those things uh, can be used for predictive behavior for faults and things like that, right? So look at all the different ways that we typically use uh, AI today. Now, when we start talking about uh, machine learning, um, it's important to sort of understand some of the the wording or definitions that get used. So, so, so what I'm presenting here is uh, some some nomenclature or taxonomy to help you sort of understand uh, the wording around machine learning, right? So, if you look at the domains, uh, you've got things like computer vision. This is this is where you're actually visually, you know, like a camera is looking at an image or a video, uh, and then able to do some uh, processing. You've got things like natural language and speech processing. So this is voice or uh, written. So this is where your large language models. And then and then you've got your classical data sciences, right? And this is why, in my personal opinion, we're quite far away from uh, AGI or general intelligence because we're only listing two of the five uh, sensors that typically most uh, uh, a large majority of humans have, right? We're, we're not even touching the other three. Um, so I said we would talk about the uh, learning paradigms, right? So let me go into supervised, unsupervised, and reinforcement. So that so with supervised learning, this is where you've already pre-classified some of your data uh, and then had the machine being given new data in order to be able to use the classified data to go uh, work on the new data, right? And so an example of this uh, that you typically see on uh, the internet would be, you know, I've I've given the machine or the model, um, this is a cat, this is a dog, this is a chicken, this is a horse, and you've pre-programmed those sorts of labels in, and then you've given it a whole bunch of other pictures. Uh, and then from those classifications, from that classification, it's able to then try and work out with a certain set of probability what all of those other unknown pictures are, right? So that's supervised learning. Um, to give you another example of supervised learning in uh, security, right? If, you, if you're familiar with things like the packet inspection or application classifications, like in your next-gen firewalls, right? So you have a predefined set of characteristics on the wire that you might say, you know, if this port is used and this type of specific things happen on a packet, it is likely a packet happening for DNS. It is likely a packet happening, you know, if you see this kind of uh, server SNI string, it's Office 365 traffic, right? So that's there's some examples of supervised learning, right? Unsupervised learning, is where you haven't classified the data initially and the model tries to work out similarities between the within the information that it's been given, right? So an example of this may be uh, denial of service is a good one to use, right? So uh, you may not be able to classify what does a denial of service packet look like on the wire for a mitigation system, but what... Uh, the model may be able to do is while it's keeping track of all the resources behind it for resource consumption or latency issues, um, what it may be able to do is say, hey, something something happened at the back. My, my latency just changed. Um, let me go look at all the data and see if there's any familiarities and patterns that I can see and then sift through that data and I might say, okay, they're all coming from different addresses but they have these certain characteristics, right? So then in a distributed denial of service attack, you might be able to say, well, it's not about the IPs, that's that's irrelevant, uh, but there may be a pattern to the type of network flow because they may be using the same tooling, uh, which gives a similar signature, right? So that's, that's a type of unsupervised learning. Reinforcement learning, I, I like to call this like, this is this is similar to if you've got pets like your dog, right? So, you know, when 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 you have puppies uh, and you want to train them, right, uh, usually you give them a treat if they've done something right and you don't give them a treat if they've done something wrong, right? So the, the, the way in which we do this with machines is very, very similar, actually, right? There's a thumbs up and a thumbs down. So every time you're giving YouTube 
a, a thumb up or Facebook, a like, or interacting with people uh, uh, in LinkedIn, all of these sorts of social networks or a love heart in um, Instagram, the machine is reinforced and says, I did something good here. I need to keep doing more of that good, right? So it's a rewarding mechanism. And so that's where um, the algorithms, you know, that we talk about um, start uh, finding ways that they can give you more of that because that that's how they get, uh, they want more treats or reinforcement, really. So the other two terminologies within, within machine learning to be uh, aware of is the idea of explainability and accuracy, right? So explainability is effectively whether the decision made by the algorithm can be understood by a human, right? So there's two ways to do this. One is when you've given specific sets of input into the model and it gives a specific sets of uh, output, right? The, the human says, yeah, I think I can work out how it did that. That seems to make sense, right? So this is a locally explainable type uh, model, right? Globally explainable is where interesting patterns or new things or uh, uh, phenomenons are effectively created by the machine and the user can uh, identify those, right? So this is when the classification starts happening, the user says, okay, or the human rather says, okay, I can understand that's how, that's how it's happening, right? Not all things have explainability, uh, but it is important to understand that, right? And accuracy. So in uh, pretty much all machine learning models, you're given a accuracy or probability score. That's just a number to say, this is how certain I am of this uh, particular output, right? So algorithms specifically provide a, a probability level, and that's what we call an accuracy level for uh, machine learning. So it's very, very good to sort of understand these this terminology so that, that you're aware of uh, what, what what can happen within within machine learning and specifically security as well. Now, how is it that we write software that actually integrates with uh, machine learning, right? So, so what you can see here is, uh, you know, the, the, the blocks up the top, this is what we call a training pipeline, right? So uh, let me see if I can use the pointer on here. Okay, so you've got data engineering here and you've got machine learning uh, engineering here, right? So all of this would be called typically a training pipeline, right? And so data engineering, this is where you're just dealing with raw data and you're trying to cleanse and curate it into something useful, right? Uh, you may have heard the terminology data is the new oil. You could call this the oil refinement or data refinement process, right? Making it into something useful. Right. When it gets into the machine learning stage, this is where the model is trained and then you start evaluating the model. And you can see that there's a tuning loop that effectively happens. I've, I've grossly simplified this diagram. And, and, and if you find variations of this diagram, it's likely because people are more uh, SMEs on the, on the machine learning side, right? So, so I've tried to make it as simple as possible. So effectively there's tuning. And so there's a feedback loop of it going backwards and forwards through here to fine tune, right? Now, this is largely a black box to a software engineer, largely, right? The top bit. And what comes out of the model validation is source code and, and sometimes a database, right? And a software engineer will write web application code or, or code to interact with the model. Right. So this is where the interaction comes in. This is your typical software engineering. But if you think about it in terms of using a Python library or using an API into uh, some sort of SAS um, uh, model, this this is where you're doing this. Right. But all of this stuff up here is uh, typically a back black box for uh, software engineers. Right. Why this is all important is I'm hoping that you can slowly start putting together where all the wheels start falling off, right? Where all the areas are as a black hat person first in order to think like a white hat person is where are all the interaction points that I can uh, potentially be malicious or what's my threat model look like? So apologies, this, this diagram came out a bit small, but again, I'll... Um, I'll, I'll put the link to the slides at the end. Um, 
what we've got here, if I still use my pointer, is this is this is the bit that we just talked about, right? This is the uh, the process of uh, making the model or the training pipeline. And here we've got our source code and our database. Now, the, the great thing about uh, working with machine learning systems is uh, it largely works in a CI CD type way natively by default. Now, you may be working in a lot of organizations where not all of your code uh, or your software processes have moved into a CRCD model, but you will typically find that if you're using machine learning in production, you're using a highly automated way of feeding through this. The, the, you wouldn't typically want a human to be doing any man, uh, manual work in this. So where this is important is this blue line up here is the continuous integration, right? This is the CI step. And here it's coming into production, right? So from development, it's coming into production. So we've got a similar set of steps here. The only one that's missing here is the exploratory stage. So this is the, the raw data. We don't need that necessarily. We just got the validation and preparation. So when data comes into the continuous integration, then you have a trained model and a registry. This is production, right? and we do continuous delivery, and this might be an API that you're exposing to users, right? This might be if you're using uh, machine learning uh, SaaS-based services right now, this is the bit that you would be interacting with as a user. Now, the really, really interesting part here is there is a feedback loop that typically happens. So this is what's called an MLOps uh, pipeline, right? This is machine learning operation is there is a feedback loop that's called continuous training that's consistently, uh, continuously rather, feeding back into the production pipeline, right? Not only that, you've got a couple of things here, which are data stores and experimental stores. So this is where you're trialing out things. And this is where you effectively have a set of your new features that the model is creating. Now, why am I making a point at listing all of these things? Um, if, if you're very, very astute, you should be working out that you've got, you've got models and data that are effectively getting mixed, right? There is no such thing as a clear boundary between training data was only in dev and production data is only production data. You, you, you're merging those things effectively within your pipeline to continuously train. So uh, this, this is problematic effectively right so i like to simplify things right to help me understand and apologies if this is too simple for you but sometimes uh when i'm when i'm working with this technology i like to put it into simple english terms right so whenever if i think of machine learning systems it's just interconnected software components that's a very very simple way to put it right and a model whenever you hear the word model i think of code and data effectively and as we just went through on the previous slide with uh, machine learning operations, these are just processes and pipelines involving the model itself, right? So this is how we think about things. So now that we've got to this stage and I spent more time talking about this, hopefully in your mind, you're starting to sort of understand without me even telling you what some of the risks are, what some of the risks with machine learning and models could be, right? So if I look at uh, the threat landscape, I don't want to spend too much time on that threat landscape, but uh, I listed it here uh, because of the, the link. ANISA is the standards body in European Union, and, and it's a fantastic document to read to get an understanding of uh, the landscape of things, right? So you'll see here, all of those things kind of sound like, well, yawn, you know, all, all software has all of these things. I don't necessarily need to think about these things. Uh, what may be relevant here is that if you've got a non-critical application that potentially starts integrating with an AI-based system, you may be turning that into a more critical system, right? So you'll have to start uh, worrying about some of these things, right? Next. Okay. So now we get to our actual risks, right? And this is not a this is not a laundry list of risks, but hopefully some of these will make absolute sense to you now that I've spent so much time talking about um, the different ways in which the models and the interactions work, right? So the first thing to get across here is that machine learning engineers are typically not software engineers. They deal with data. 
right? They deal with operational data. And and as we know, as AppSec engineers, software engineers are not always AppSec people, right? So we've just spent, you know, the last few years talking about uh, integrating security into DevOps and, you know, having security champions. We've just added another role into this mix, right? And so if we're talking about things like moving closer to where the code is built, right? At the really at the beginning, we have to start thinking about things all the way at the start of the machine learning process, not just at the software engineering process. Because as I showed you, um, the software engineer is typically only interacting with the models itself, right? So let's talk some, uh, about some of the risks, right? So these might sound boring to you, but uh, these are probably likely to be the highest risks as we start getting public breaches of these sorts of things, right? So things like credentials as code. Uh, this is not a software engineer writing this likely now. This is a machine learning engineer writing this. They probably don't think their models are ever going to make it out of their, their environments or they're in a closed loop, right? Software dependencies and lifecycle management of the libraries that you use. Big, big, big problem. As we talked about, uh, typically you deal with the models from an API point of view or uh, you may be presenting uh, the information from the machine learning model uh, in a web app. So all of your typical web and API threats uh, apply here. Uh, denial of service uh, is a interesting uh, problem statement within machine learning systems because uh, you're going to see more of what's, what I probably will get called uh, you know, denial of uh, a financial type of denial, right? Uh, a lot of these machine learning systems take up huge amounts of GPU and resources. So similar to in, in web application uh, attacks, where if I know you're doing a query that's going to take you a long amount of time, I can I can hold up the database, right? That's called the layer seven heavy, heavy URL type attack, right? It goes probably a thousand X worse when you get to denial of service, because if I know that you're doing um, some sort of bot mitigation and you're using uh, machine learning, uh, why don't I just throw hundreds and thousands of connections at you so that uh, you're not necessarily blocking it with denial of service, but your machines are now trying busily to work out what's happening, right? And you're just chewing up resources on the cloud, right? Um, if we get to the specifically the threats about machine learning itself, so these are dealing with uh, machine learning model threats, right? And the data itself. So a lot of the threats here, uh, quite honestly, don't come from research that's from the AppSec uh, part of the industry. These are people that actually understand uh, data science or the models themselves. And so a lot of these have been done by security researchers. Uh, and uh, I would say that it's probably theoretical. Some of these could be theoretical, uh, but we're not going to hear about these sorts of things until we get uh, public breach uh, notifications as to say, you know, these are the sorts of things that have been attacked, right? So if we talk about some of these, just, just briefly, uh, malicious models, this is where you're actually using a model uh, from somewhere else, right? You could be using it from a SaaS-based service, but the model itself, remember I said it has code and data, can have code and data. So what if that model had backdoors in it, Trojans in it, right? All of those things can exist inside a model because it's just software and data, right? Um, so that's a little bit scary. Data poisoning is a very, very interesting one. This is where you are as a malicious or adversarial uh, person, you are trying to poison the data in order to be able to uh, have it influence the way that it behaves with its output, right? And actually, a lot of these actually deal with input and output, right? Manipulating the input in order to get a generated output that is of benefit to the adversary and and uh, for, for whatever reason that they want, right? Now, it's not like a web attack that you can actually look at the uh, input being created and say, well, I know that's definitely uh, malicious, right? You can't necessarily at the moment write signatures for all of these things. This is where, this is why it's quite important. Um, 
data extraction is, uh, as the word says, um, this is about being able to steal uh, data from your model, so for theft and things like that. Model theft is exactly as it says, you know, just as if you have to worry about uh, employees or people stealing your source code, if you've got intellectual property, uh, your models can be stolen as well. That That is your effectively your, uh, another part of your intellectual property. Repurposing is an interesting one. So this is where if someone has your model, they use it for something else that it was not intended for, right? And inferences, uh, inferences if you're familiar with SQL attacks, is uh, it's similar to blind SQL attacks where you're not actually getting a response, but you're able to tell by some other metadata, like how long the response took, maybe the error message, things like that. And then you're able to piece together potentially the information that you need. Model inference is similar. So it's about doing specific types of input in order to be able to get an output and go, okay, based on this information, I think I know how the model's working, right? So as I mentioned, some of these things um, at the moment are, are all proven and done in, in research at least. And, uh, you know, we need to get to a point where we understand the likelihood of some of these things, right? So that we can do our risk management. So let me just go into um, some types of adversarial attacks, right? So uh, let me just show you, let me just stop the share and... Up. Okay, so normally I wouldn't say just go running uh, things off other people's websites, but this particular uh, person actually has their source code in Git, uh, GitHub, right? So I look through the source code. So just to give you an example of something, um, if we if we take a your old golf ball, you can see here, prediction. And so I said, remember the output is likelihood and probability, right? So let's try and turn this into a hot dog. Takes a little bit of time. Okay. Looks exactly the same to us, right? Very, very close. You can't tell the difference. So let's run it through the neural network. Prediction, hot dog. Actually got very, very high probability. So if I click this, you'll see this was the noise that was introduced into that image that we can't see by the human eye, right? And if you want to have someone play, have a really bad day at airport security, they can try and turn their golf ball into something that looks like an assault rifle, right? Again, very, very hard to tell. Right? That's 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 all the that's all the difference that's been uh, produced and we could run it through and get 97%, right? So if I go back to the share, I'm check, okay, we're doing good. Okay. So I want to go through the next ones just fairly quickly because I just wanted to go through the, the project itself as well, right? So I'll quickly fly through some of these and the internet's full of these sorts of things, right? So here, here we've got individuals that use a patch specifically to be uh, not visible or unclassified within camera systems, right? Uh, similar thing over here, got an individual that can be identified and once they put patches on, they can't be, right? And on the right-hand side, you can see uh, if it's too small to see, up the top, the classifier correctly picks it as a uh, banana. Down the bottom, uh, with this information, it thinks it's a toaster, effectively, right? So these are these are some types of attacks. The one on the left here is my favorite. There's actually a website called Adversarial Fashion. Uh, this gentleman is wearing uh, registration plates, and so the photo thinks that there is a vehicle uh, of a specific type and an orientation just based on that photo alone, right? Um, and over here, we can see that we've got an Apple and now it thinks it's an iPod just because it's got a, a image across it. And these dollar signs uh, make this look like a classification for a piggy bank. And similarly over here um, as well, right? So 
Um, I'll go through, so apologies for going through that bit quickly because I want to get to the actual project itself, right? So what we're trying to do with the OWAS Top 10 project, and by the way, we're officially soft launching it today and we'd like you all as contributors, right? So what we're actually doing with the Top 10 risks is being able to give uh, an idea of uh, how likely are you to see specific types of attacks, right? Similar to other OWASP projects that you would uh, know about. So let me just open up the website itself and just go through it, right? So uh, I didn't put a QR code, but mltop10.info, hopefully that's easy enough to remember. And I'll just quickly go through a few things because I saw uh, in the poll that uh, a few folks did say that they wanted to help contribute, right? So on the site, you'll see that at the moment we're in draft mode, and this means that we're still working on getting all the content and things right. And why we're launching it is because it's ready for contributions effectively. So a couple of things to just go through if you're not familiar with how the top tens work is... Uh, generally, there's a description of the type, um, how to prevent, uh, along with the risk factors. So this is how you can sort of start making up a, a risk management decision on how likely you are to see it, along with some attack scenarios, right? So this is the format that they all take in here. Now, if you're interested in contributing, I'll quickly go through a couple of, we've got a couple of different ways that we can contribute to this, right? So if I click on one of the ML top 10 pages, you'll see all the way down the bottom, there's a commenting section uh, and that works with a program called Gis Giscus, uh, which uses uh, OAuth to uh, use your credentials uh, from GitHub in order to be able to type. So if you wanted to do like or type, right? What, what this means is all of this shows up within the GitHub repo itself. Right. Um, the source code for the Giscus app is actually on GitHub itself. So you can read the source code that they're not doing anything nefarious in order to use your uh, credentials to be able to uh, post on your behalf. One of the other ways uh, that we're looking to get contributions is like some of the contributors are actually uh, scientists or researchers. Um, and so they may not be uh, familiar with using GitHub and things like that. So we've got a uh, service called Hypothesis. And down the bottom here, you can see that I've got a, a um, an extension. Um, and Hypothesis, I'll, I'll write up a, a page for this. But effectively, what it does is it can have an overlay. So you can see automatically this is an annotation that shows up and you can have annotations across your pages and, and talk across those as well. I'll just show you another one where on the page it should show up. There we go. So if I click on that, you see that I've got like an annotation as well, right? So there's some of the methods that you can actually um, comment or like or provide feedback for within the site itself. If you're looking to get uh, your hands more dirty and work on the actual uh, risk management, uh, the risk management processes themselves, you'll see there's an edit page, right? When you click on that, it'll automatically take you to the markdown page in our repository. Uh, and then you can provide feedback that way, right? So this is your using, we're effectively in the project using Git as managing our operations for mergers, all of those sorts of things, right? Uh, I don't think I have much time to go through much else, but one of the things that I would encourage you all to read, firstly, is the wiki page. So this page, the beginning page, has all the information you need. So the first thing you should all do uh, after this call uh, is read this page and work out which, which method you would like to uh, join uh, the project whether it's through email, whether it's through Slack, or whether it's through live GitHub discussions, you'll see that we've got quite lively discussions happening here as well, right? And so from this, uh, we're hoping to get uh, all of you to help contribute as well. Last thing before uh, I finish is one of the things that I've learned uh, in, inside F5, uh, working as part of the open source program office, is how to, uh, how to uh, measure community health, right? And so one of the one of the things that I'm actually measuring for the project is how much, uh, there's a bunch of metrics that Linux Foundation have put together around community health, right? How often do people 
contribute? Is it just the one person that's contributing all the time? How often are PRs? How often are PRs uh, responded to? Um, are the PRs linked to issues? All of these sorts of things. We're wonderful, wonderful sets of information. So tracking all of these to make sure that we're we're quite high. Like you can see that we're quite we're above sixty, which is good. We've only had a few contributors so far. Um, hoping to see this go up as well. All right. Um, and lastly, just before I finish. that we want to see your name in here right so this is the lovely list of contributors that uh have worked with us during this beta process to help out uh on the project so you see those little emojis or icons this means that you don't actually have to just contribute by helping with the uh the top 10 risks you can do project admin uh, some some individuals here are very, very active at sort of uh, helping as a community on the OWASP channel, answering questions on the on the Slack channels, right? Um, some people have started advertising the project externally. So evangelism of the project and telling other people about the project. So contribution can mean different things to different people and it's whatever you're comfortable with. And uh, right at the very beginning, I mentioned that it was going to be important that I talked about why I wasn't specifically a machine learning or uh, AI expert, but I'm still able to contribute to this project as well, right? So you'll see here we've got uh, Rob and Saga, who are also project co-leads. So Rob has uh, more than 30 years experience in AI. I don't know how many people can say that. Uh, in the world, and, and he's very, very active in in ISO and the EU for standards around artificial intelligence. So we're lucky to have him as a project co-lead. And we've got uh, my friend uh, Saga, who I said was going to help co-present, uh, who's unfortunately in uh, Paris at the moment. So Saga is a software engineer. So he knows uh, a lot about coding the machine learning but he's also an application security engineer as well, right? But uh, really, uh, you know, I mentioned the project co-leads, but we we all bring different skill sets. And, and the beauty of OWASP is uh, there is no one face to a project, right? So uh, I will know that this project has become prime time or successful when no one knows who the project co-leads are, right? I'm not the face of this project. Saga isn't, Rob isn't, right? We want you all to be talking about the project. We want you all to contribute because it should be about the content that we produce and we want to make that uh, high quality. So with that, uh, I will say thank you and we'll pass over to questions. Awesome. Uh, thank you so much, Mr. Shansing. So, uh, so there are a couple of questions. Uh, so the first one, which is asked by Arpit Tripathi, are there any open source projects development based available for ML security? Uh, yes. Yes. So off the top of my head, it, it depends what we mean by uh, uh, open source projects for machine learning security, because um, uh, one of the things that I mentioned initially that we were going to do was uh, do demos. So uh, we can certainly show you uh, there aren't like big name sort of software. It's more about playing with models and then working out what you can do with models effectively, right? There are, uh, the names escaping me at the moment, there is a project that I think IBM started in open source, something about an adversarial toolkit or something. That's certainly the biggest name thing that I've heard. Um, but generally, it's not like you don't have a Kali Linux or anything like that that you can throw at this problem. Um, it's more about getting a model, like a computer vision model or a classification model, and then poking around and playing with it. Great question, though. So another question that we have, when will the top 10 list be out of beta? Ah, good question. So... The trick with that one, when will it be out of beta, is actually in the in the title of the web page. It says 2023 edition, right? So we only have a few months left uh, of 2023. 
and we're hoping to get the content uh, at least up to a release candidate uh, level so that people can start using it and not uh, just uh, contributing to it. So yeah, I'll say by the end of 2023. Awesome, awesome. Also, is uh, the top 10 list similar to the LLM top 10 list? Ah, this is a great question. How, how much time have we got to answer this one? So like the LLM top 10 is a fantastic project. So uh, what I will say is the LLM top 10 is fantastic for two reasons, actually. One is uh, I look at it from with my open source or community hat. Uh, being able to start a open source community, regardless of content, and get it to a production level with hundreds and hundreds of people and being able to you know, collaborate all of that information to a you know, to an artifact that's that's used by a lot of people and it's being you know, referred to in a lot of articles, that is astounding. You know, software projects can learn from that. You know, Steve and the team have done a wonderful job on that, right? Um, the second way I look at it is in, in, the, in the way of content. So uh, Rob and I have actually, and Saga have spoke about uh, uh, contacting Steve or collaborating with Steve rather, uh, and working out, as I said, that um, LLM forms part of deep learning, which forms part of machine learning, right? So there are going to be things that uh, the production version of LLM has that fit into machine learning and and similarly the other way around, right? Like we're, we're potentially talking about things uh, that are also covered in there. The other way I sort of look at the content is um, the LLM top 10 gives us really nice uh, uh, what I would call use cases for some of the things that were talked about. So, you know, I sort of briefly went through our machine learning risks, right? And I said, well, a lot of these right now have been done by researchers. Well, LLM is a subset of those sorts of things. So a lot of people are trying a lot of things with chat GPT and all of these language models. So you could actually use that as a way of describing a, a tax scenario for our project as well, right? Awesome, awesome. So I don't think there's any question left from the audience as of now. So if you have any questions, feel free to reach out to Mr. Shan Singh. And I would like to thank you for presenting and talking about security of machine learning systems. On that note, thank you so much everyone for joining. Hope you learned something new. Hope you learned something amazing. Thank you, everyone.